And 1 Corinthians 13 has been felt all the way through our reading of this letter to the Corinthian church. Because with every problem that Paul addresses, love is what he will suggest. And that we are to do things in a way that brings glory to God. We're to do things in a way that shows love and respect and honors the dignity of human life. We're to do things in a way that lovingly presents a witness uh, to the outside world, to those who are yet to believe and those who are yet to put their trust and faith in Christ. In the context, um, chapter 13 is sandwiched between a discussion of spiritual gifts. So in chapter 12, we've learned that we are one body in Christ. We are many members. We have different gifts. Um, but we are really, truly one. And when one part suffers, all have cause to suffer. When one part has cause to rejoice, all have cause to rejoice. And chapter 13 sort of helps us to see that in a, in a, in a very powerful way. And then chapter 14 continues this discussion of spiritual gifts. And uh, he'll talk about how the gift of prophecy or proclamation um, is a right important gift. Um, but it also pales in comparison to love. And so we'll, we'll look at that carefully. Uh, he begins with the last part of chapter 12, verse 31. He says, and now I will show you the most excellent way. Uh, he's been talking about different spiritual gifts, but as you'll see in the verses that follow, uh, all of these gifts are outmatched by love. In fact, you could have every spiritual gift, but if you don't have love, it kind of amounts to nothing. Now help me remember who he's writing to. What are some characteristics of this Corinthian church? Bickering and fighting. Bickering and fighting. Why, wonder why? Want their way. They want their way. Uh, do they love each other? Deep down, maybe. Okay, we have to get, answer that with a maybe. We don't know. Doesn't, doesn't look like it. But maybe they do. What house would you describe the Corinthian church? Different classes. Okay. Different social classes. Different um, religious backgrounds um, that, that enter in and cause conflict and cause cliques and um, small groups within the larger group. What else? They're being affected by the culture. Okay. Uh, the church should be an agent of transformation in the culture. Uh, Jesus told us that we are salt. Now, I don't know if you've ever um, seasoned food with salt or not. Does it make any difference? Yeah, yeah it really can. Uh, we're to make a difference. But sometimes the world influences the church more than the church influences the world. And the Corinthian church, unfortunately, was a victim to that. Uh, they let the world call the shots, and instead of being an influence and a vibrant witness, they allowed the culture to, to influence how they did things and how they lived and how they treated each other. How else would you describe these Corinthians? Modern. Yes. John said modern. Um, they have the same problems we have. Um, and so even though 200, 2,000, excuse me, years have passed, uh, human nature has not changed. We have not evolved. We have not gotten any better. Uh, we're still stuck in the same selfish squabbles that the people of the first century were stuck in. Uh, it has not improved at all. How about us? Misguided as Christians. Okay, misguided. There were a lot of things they were doing that hurt their witness and hurt their times of fellowship together. We looked at some of the practices with the Agape Feast and the Lord's Supper. Um, they had a whole different view about what was acceptable to God. And you remember Paul has to talk to them about idolatry and sexual immorality and those kinds of things because uh, they, they were not um, following the teachings of Christ very carefully. So this is a troubled church and um, a modern church. And Paul will lift up love as an answer. Uh, he's been pointing to it all the way through, and he'll help us to know what love really is. Now, in our culture, the word love is brandished about very freely. But if we want to know what God means by love, 1 Corinthians 13 is a beautiful starting point uh, to begin to get a grasp or a sense of, of what God intends when he tells us that we should love each other 
as he loves us. So he says, now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Uh, the pagans uh, use these gongs and clanging sounds in their worship, just as many uh, religions of today use that kind of uh, sound. Uh, and Paul says, even if we could speak in all the different languages, if we had the spiritual gift of speaking in heavenly tongues, if we had the spiritual gift of learning uh, languages, or, or even what happened on the day of Pentecost when there was a miracle of hearing and a miracle of speaking, where, there, where everyone heard the gospel in their own language. Um, even if we could have that, but if we don't have love, is it valuable? No, it's just noise. It's just sounds. Uh, not even pleasant sounds. Like a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Do you all remember the gong show? Uh, you have to go way back in your memory for that one. But it was a, a TV show where they would have performers. And um, as the performers would carry on, eventually one of the celebrity guests would end their act by gonging them. Uh, pulling them off that way. He goes on, if I have the gift of prophecy, now in chapter 14, he will lift up the gift of prophecy. Um, what is prophecy? Foretelling of uh, things to come. Okay, sometimes it is to foretell uh, what is going to happen. Uh, we think of a prophet as one who predicts the future or foretells the future. And sometimes the prophets in the Old Testament had that role. Uh, God spoke to them. And they told the people what was going to happen. But in the New Testament particularly, it has a broader connotation as one who proclaims God's word. One who preaches. Uh, one who, who uh, helps people to understand and see the scriptures. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. Now, are there, is there anything y'all don't know? <laughs> Are there any questions or problems that mankind has not here today solved? How much time you got in? Yeah. <laughs> well, Paul says if we had all the mysteries solved, if we knew everything, had all knowledge, could fathom all the mysteries. Uh, and, he goes on, if I have faith that can move mountains, now that's pretty impressive. Jesus said if your faith is as small as a mustard seed, you'll be able to move mountains. Um, if we had faith that moved mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So even with all those wonderful, beautiful gifts, if love is missing from them, it's not going to accomplish anything. He goes on, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Even the most sacrificial gift that we can give doesn't amount to anything if it's not given out of love. So Paul here identifies love as the key ingredient. Now he's been talking about spiritual gifts. Um, are spiritual gifts important? Yes. <laughs> Will we be called to account for how we use the gifts that were entrusted to us? Yes. But here Paul reminds us that if we exercise these gifts without love, we're just making noise. It amounts to nothing. Love is absolutely essential. Uh, love is the determining factor. And that's hard for us sometimes. Um, Sometimes in business they use the phrase to be people-oriented or task-oriented. And some folks are very task-oriented. They've got a mission, they've got a task, they're going to get that task done. And sometimes the human element of emotions and how other people feel gets sort of left out of that task-oriented drive. Um, and they're people-oriented people who sometimes don't get anything done because they're you know, focused on emotions and making everybody feel okay. And that task part is is without. But here, Paul emphasizes the importance of love. Um, everything must be done in love. Love is essential. 
And he'll help us um, understand what love really looks like. And his description defies um, our common understanding of love. So what he's writing here is countercultural. Um, first, let's look at it, though, and realize that this describes God's love for us. I don't know how loved you feel today. Uh, maybe it's been a difficult day. Maybe you've had to wrestle with lots of different alligators. I, I, I don't know. Um, but as you look at these verses, remember that God is very patient with you. He does not give up on you. He is kind um, to you. Um, he doesn't envy. He doesn't boast. He's not proud. He's not rude. He's not self-seeking. He's not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. He doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He protects, trusts, hopes, and perseveres. So, so this helps us to, to understand the kind of love that God has for us. But it also helps us to know the love that God wants us to have for each other. Now, when couples are talking about getting married, one of the things I encourage them to do is to read 1 Corinthians 13 together on a daily basis. Now, why would I do such a thing? Well, for one thing, I'm a firm believer that reading the Bible is good. Uh, it's helpful. But as couples read this, they will discover, you know, it says here love is patient, but I wasn't patient today. It says here love doesn't keep a record of wrongs, but here's my list. You know, um, and so if they really want the kind of love they're supposed to have for each other, 1 Corinthians 13 is, is like a... Um, what do you call those things where you tie, uh, you have a string and um, a rock or something, and um, it helps you to know if you're building straight? Plumb line. Plumb line, or, or a level, uh, might could be used that way. First Corinthians 13 helps us to self-correct uh, that way. One other thing I need to tell you, though, is um, in and of ourselves, we're selfish. We are self-centered. So where does this love have to come from? It has to come from God. Um, so in order for us to love the way God has commanded us to love, the way Jesus has told us to love, that love has to come from God. If we are looking for it to come out of our own selfishness, our love will be pale and pitiful and not up to the task. But if we learn to rely on the love that God has for us, then we are able to love and we're able to do these things. All right, it says here that love is patient. Uh, the Greek word for patience is interesting. It literally or figuratively means to slow boil, to be slow to boil. Now, I don't know if y'all have ever had to wait on a pot to boil or that kind of thing, um, but um, sometimes I get busy and the pot um, boils and then it overflows, right? So what do you do under certain circumstances? Do you have to start over? Take it on the heat. All right, you could reduce the heat. Or sometimes even taking the, the, the top off of the pot will help a little bit. Um, but if you reduce the heat and you reduce it just right, it will continue to boil, but it won't boil over, right? So what's that mean for us? If a person is slow to boil. What's that mean? They don't get angry in a hurry. <laughs> All right, they don't get angry at a person in, in, in a hurry. Patience. They have patience. Uh, it takes a lot uh, for them to reach their boiling point. Uh, they are very patient. Now, why is this related to love? How is patience connected to love? God has patience with us. He does. He does. And one of the ways, uh, you know, it's been said over and over, don't pray for patience. Because God will put you in a situation where you have to learn patience. And that's, that can be very, very uncomfortable. Uh, but one of the ways we can, one of the easier ways for us to learn patience is for us to think about all the ways that God is patient with us. And while we're at it, we can think about how we have to have other people in our lives who are patient with us too. And that helps us to reciprocate that 
and to become people who are patient uh, with others. Um, is patience easy? Why not? Well, it's because you think, sometimes you think other people, or other persons are dumb. Things they do are dumb. You're judging, you're kind of judging. You're kind of judging is what you're doing. Okay. All right. That's been one of the big concerns with this coronavirus because, in a sense, our health and well-being is dependent on the common sense and good judgment of those around us. And that's a bit scary, isn't it? Because people don't always act with common sense and good judgment. It's lacking sometimes. I think we grew up in a society where you, you grew up trying to get it now. Okay. And the sooner you can reach where you want to be in life, the better off you'll be with when that's okay. actually not true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Years ago, our youth, I think they did it twice, but there was a musical that our youth uh, performed. And one, one time it was a dinner theater in here, and it was particularly nice. But uh, the musical was called Waiters, and it was about a group of waiters at a restaurant. But it was also about learning to wait on the Lord. But one of the songs in the musical that I think just, they, they nailed human nature. Uh, I want what I want when I want it. And that's us. Um, I've discovered that people are generally happy as long as they get their way in exactly the right terms of exactly how they wanted it, with no deviation. And that's how we are. Uh, we don't have that kind of patience um, because of our own selfishness. Love is patient and love is kind. What is kindness? Helping people in general and put forth a helping hand and having compassion on people. Okay. Was Jesus kind? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any examples? Well, the miracles that he did. Even though he was tried beyond patience a few times, he, he still, he said, unless they saw me, they would Okay. Um, we've been in the Gospel of John here recently, and his first miracle was at a wedding at Cana of Galilee. Um, and it was an act of kindness. Or I think about the woman who had expended all of her resources and was still sick and was unclean, and she reaches and touches Jesus' robe. Y'all remember that story? But he's on his way to an emergency. Uh, a man's daughter is dying, and he stops. And not only does he stop, but he asked for her and asked for her whole story. And I can imagine the other people are thinking, they probably didn't have wristwatches, but they're, they're just wondering, how long is this going to take? How long are we going to be delayed? How long are we going to have to listen? And not only that, Jesus calls her daughter. Uh, kindness. Jesus was very kind. Um, when he washed the disciples' feet, I think that was a special act. Oh, Yes. Kindness. I think he was kind to the thief on the cross, too. Yes. He didn't do everything. He forgave him. Kindness to the thief on the cross. Kindness requires an intentionality on our part. I hope it can come naturally. I hope we can get in the habit of kindness to the point that we don't even think about it. it just, it's just part of who we are. Um, but many times it requires some thought on our part, um, some intentionality to be kind. Um, Paul writes, love is kind. It does not envy. Love does not envy. How would you define envy? Jealousy. Okay, it's a cousin, close cousin. They're probably even kissing cousins. Jealousy and envy. What is envy? When you see something and you want it, and you sort of turn in your heart, and it's going to be the worst. Okay, and it doesn't even have to be a thing. Um, you might be a single person around a lot of married people, and it's not that you want their marriage. It's that you, you know, are unhappy because you're not like. You feel like you're missing something that they have. Does that make sense? 
We become envious. What's the problem with being envious? All right, it is a form of ingratitude because we don't see what we should be thankful for. One of the things I said Sunday that I, that I liked uh, <laughs> is that this time last year, we didn't even know all the things we needed to be grateful for. Yeah. Uh, but our world has changed, and so we have become grateful. Sue, I missed what you were saying. Uh, I forgot. <laughs> I didn't forget. I was listening in with intent what you said about this time last year. It just led me after you said that. Okay. I think again, it makes us self-centered too. Yes. We're worried about what we want or what we don't have. And when we think about what we don't have, what are we also doing? Are we trusting God who is providing for our every need, who gives every good and perfect gift that we have? No, because we want something else. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're not appreciative, we're not grateful for the things he has done for us. So love does not envy. Uh, love is, gets in the way, excuse me, envy gets in the way of love. It doesn't boast. Um, and it's not proud. And it's not rude. And it's not self-seeking. Now, I don't know if Paul had particular people in mind <laughs> in the Corinthian church as he's writing this. Um, but, you know, churches are made up of sinful people. Churches are led by sinful people. How in the world are we supposed to operate if we're all sinners? It's got to be love. We have to extend grace and receive grace. That's the only way it will work. If you are looking for something to be offended by, can you find it? Oh, yeah. yeah, you make a list, a long list. Um, so if that's your intention, oh yeah, no problem. And that's not just true with our church, that's true with any church. I think it's in true, it's with people in general. There was people out that I deal with them all the time. They they were looking to be offended. You have to really be careful. Try to be careful. There's another principle here that I, I just feel compelled to point out to you. Let's pretend maybe it's a politician. Maybe it's a doctor that you used to see. Maybe it's a neighbor. And you don't like them. Y'all with me so far? Most probably, anything they do is going to displease you. Because you have already decided that you don't like them. Set your mind, right? It would take an incredible act on their part to overcome that. Do, do y'all agree with me? Does that really happen? Am I making this stuff up? All right, let's turn it around, though. Let's say you really like them. In fact, you love them. Are you willing to put up with their flaws and their weaknesses? Yeah. If you really care about somebody, you're going to put up with a lot, and it would take an awful lot to turn your heart against them. Y'all with me? All right. When we love each other, the way we're supposed to, the way Jesus has asked us to, the way Jesus has commanded us to, then we're going to love each other with a love. It's, it's not a, a permissiveness. It's not a looking the other way kind of thing. But it's a love that accepts that other person for a person who is growing in Christ, a person who does make mistakes, a person who does have flaws just like we do, um, but, but it's a, it, an atmosphere of grace that comes when love is there. Do, do y'all see that? And that's really the only way a church can function. And to be what a church should be. Because Jesus did not say, if you have a pretty steeple, they'll know you're my followers. Or if you have a nice budget and meet the budget every week, they'll know you're my followers. He said, if you love each other, if you care about each other, that's how people will know that you belong to me. Well, love does not keep, well, I stopped, I think, earlier. 
Love is not easily angered. And we can talk about that a little bit with patience. Um, what's that mean? If you're not easily angered, what are you? Okay. <laughs> Love is not easily angered. Well, I mean, you know, anger is a description. There's not a measure to it. Okay. Make you a Okay. You have a peace or you're calm. Oh, so that's wonderful. If the peace of Christ rules, guards our hearts and minds, are we someone who is easily angered? No. No. Now, we might be passionate about the things that Jesus is passionate about. He was passionate about God's name and worship and love for people. Um, but we're not going to be easily angered um, that way. Love is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Do we? No grudges. Yes. Yeah. What happens to us when we hold grudges? You're not supposed to let it go overnight. Okay. Paul will write to the church at Ephesus, don't let the sun go down in your anger. Don't, don't hold these things more than a 24-hour period. Uh, okay. What happens to us if we hold grudges? Say it again. It eats at you. It robs you of joy. It keeps you from enjoying well, that other person may be over it. They may not even realize they did anything. But, but you are rehearsing and nursing that hurt uh, over and over uh, when you keep a record of wrongs. Does it interfere with our ability to love each other? Yeah, it does. Um, now, as a single person, I'm not going to pick on you married people too badly. But this is an area especially where husbands and wives might struggle, isn't it? Because you've had some history together. Um, and, you know, in all those years, you've never had a fight. But on that occasion where you do, people tend to remember those things. And um, my psychology professor used to talk about it as going up into the attic. Um, because when there's one offense, it brings back the eight other offenses. Um, and so not only do you fuss at that person for the thing that bothered you that day, you fuss at them for what they did the day before, the day before that, the week before that, and the month before that, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, as a pastor, I struggle with this. I've been privileged and blessed to be your pastor now for almost 25 years. But you know, the people that got angry with me the first year I was here, they're still angry. And the people that got angry with me the second year I was here, they're still angry. And the people who got angry with me the third year I was here, I won't go through all 25 years, but, but it's a cumulative effect, isn't it? Why? Because we hold on to grudges. We keep a record of wrongs. Um, and if anybody slights us to any degree, we make note of it. It's as if we have a little Barney Fife notebook that we pull out <laughs> you know, and write it all down. Um, because mentally that's what we do. But that's very unhealthy, isn't it? Why do we do that? That's a good question. Why How can we stop? Change of heart. Yeah. Change of heart. How can we stop keeping a record of wrongs? Pray for the people on that record. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Now, we had a problem uh, years ago um, with some of our, of our children because they were praying that their brother would get hit by a car or a tree would fall on them or that kind of thing. And we tried to redirect that uh, prayerful intention. We're to pray for our enemies, but we're not supposed to pray bad things for our enemies or curses on our enemies. We're supposed to pray for their good, for their well-being. And even if someone has hurt you, deeply. If you will pray for them every day, God may zap them and change their heart. But I can almost guarantee you He will change your heart. And He will give you compassion and understanding and patience and love as you lift that person up in prayer. 
So one of the ways we cannot keep a record of wrongs is to pray for those folks who in some way we feel have offended us. I missed what you said, Tommy. Oh, follow Jesus' example. Follow Jesus' example. Okay. What did he do? He forgave everything. He did. He did talk to the just like when he forgives our sins. Yes. Or the from the wet. Okay. As he was um, dying on the cross, his words were, Father, forgive them. Um, he is a gracious, loving God. He does not keep record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And so I don't want you to get the idea that love approves of sin. It doesn't. Why does God hate sin? I think we talked about this in Sunday school this past Sunday. Why does God hate sin? It separates us from Him. It separates us from Him. And it is very, very destructive in our lives. God hates sin because He loves us. And he sees what sin does. Um, Y'all have heard of mama bears, haven't you? Mama bears protect their children, look after their cubs that way. Uh, if a mother uh, was in a room with a rattlesnake with her children, would she uh, work to get the children away from the rattlesnake? Yes. Uh, God sees what sin can do to us. And so love... Real love does not delight in evil, uh, but rejoices with the truth. And it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. It, it, it hangs in there. It stays with it. It sees the good in people. That was something else that Jesus did that's just incredible. He would look at someone and see the good, see the image of God in them. Love never fails. Uh, and we forget. We try everything but love. <laughs> but love will work. It may not work in the, in the time frame that we are expecting. Uh, but love will prevail. Love will win. Love never fails. Now where there are prophecies, where there's preaching, it will cease. When? Well, I need to preach to you in heaven. I will not. I will be out of a job and very happy about it. Um, prophecy, it will cease. Where their tongues, as important as that might be, they'll be still. Where there's knowledge, it'll pass away. Um, in heaven, I think we'll know more than we do now, but there are a lot of things we know now that aren't necessary in heaven. So there'll be things that will just pass away. We won't need it anymore. I probably will not know, you know, need to know all the ins and outs of, you know, working on my computer. At least I hope not in heaven. That knowledge can pass away. And I'll be happy about that. Um, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. Did y'all get that? All right, right now we love each other. At least I hope we do. I want us to. I'm working toward that. Uh, and I want you to know that you are loved. Uh, I think one of the most valuable things I can do as your pastor is to love you. Now, I'd like for you to learn a little bit about the Bible, and I'd like for you to become a, you know, a disciple of Christ who makes disciples. But probably the most valuable thing I can give you is to love you. Does that make sense? So we, we want to love each other. We should love each other. But I can't love you without there being at least some selfishness on my part. And you can't love me without there being at least some selfishness on your part. Uh, that is our sinful nature, and it goes against what love really is. But one day, we will be able to love each other. Uh, as we stand before God's throne, we will love each other the way God loves us now without any kind of selfishness, without any kind of impure motive at all. And, and, and that will be another one of the beautiful gifts of heaven. And Paul here is writing that when that perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. He goes on to help us understand when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. 
When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. So just as we forget how we were as little children, um, wouldn't it be nice if we had some recordings of how we sounded at you know, five or six or seven years old? Uh, a whole different world uh, for us. But we forget those things because we live in a different world now. Have y'all ever been back to somewhere that you only went as a child? Uh, my elementary school um, used to be huge, and now all the walls have been pushed together, and it's narrow the hallways are. I, I just couldn't believe it, how they did all that change um, after I left. So we forget those things. We mature. We grow. Now we see that a poor reflection is in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And I take a lot of comfort in verse 12. Uh, I will know even as I am known. How does God know us now? Completely. Knows the number of hairs we have on our head. Knows the intentions and motives of our heart. Knows when we stand and when we sit. In fact, He knows us better than we know ourselves. I believe that in heaven, we will know each other with that same fullness, with that same richness. And that will increase our love, not decrease our love for each other. Um, because not only will I know the mistakes you've made, but I'll know why you made them. I'll know the context that those things fit into. And I will have a heart of compassion for you in the midst of those things. Does that make any sense? Uh, we will know as we are known. Um, and that's hard for some people. There, there's a... A strong belief that maybe we won't know each other in heaven. But I think verses like this teach us that we really will. In fact, one of the great joys of heaven will be that we'll be able to fellowship and love each other in a way that's not possible here. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. One day, our faith will be made sight. One day, our hopes will be realized. But we'll still have love. Love will endure. Love will continue. Love will be our theme. The love that God has for us and the love that we share and the love that we have for each other. Right now, we can practice. Um, are we going to be able to fulfill 1 Corinthians 13 perfectly? So should we just give up on it? No, in learning to be patient, some amazing things can happen. In learning not to keep a record of wrongs, some amazing things can happen. To overcome our desire to be envious, some amazing things can happen. Um, and so we're given this uh, to help us to know what love really is and how we are to treat each other and how to put to use these spiritual gifts. It was a message that the Corinthians desperately needed. It's a message that we desperately need to. Father, thank you for the opportunity to look at your word. While this is a familiar and beautiful passage of scripture, it is a very difficult passage for us to live. And each day we err against it. Oh, Father, allow it to be a plumb line in our lives. Allow us to have the wisdom to, to stop sinning and to allow your love to flow through us. Help us that we might be people of patience because you are patient with us. People of kindness because you have been so kind to us. Allow the forgiveness and grace we've experienced to become in us a channel where we can be gracious and forgiving to others. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name.